Even if you started a resolution, you already fucked it up. Listen, restart it again. You know what I'm saying? That's why I don't like resolutions. If I want to do something in the new year, I start in December, so there's no pressure. So by January, it sticks. You follow me? Anyway, it's Thursday the 24th. I hope you guys are doing well today. A lot of fucking people have been hitting me up lately. And yeah, it's a lot of like, you know, we saw this, we saw that. We went to see you, we're going to see you. But it's also a lot of questions. A lot of questions about like growth. And the one thing people have the hardest problem with that we all did, listen, you know, is uh, decisions. It's the decision to do something, stick with it, and believe in it. You know, when I get these emails, I look at them, and people are like, well, I got this offered to me. And it's not about. It's not career. It's not comedy questions. They're career questions. They're they're drug choices. They're when I say drug choices, it's somebody who's trying to get off drugs. Okay, so it's you know they 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 saw something, they came to a reality and they hit me up because uh, they want to tell me they clean 11 days or something like that. And these are all great things. I, I love all this kind of stuff. But the thing I, I see that people struggle with the most. So I thought about it for a few weeks, and I wrote about it, you know, and it's making that decision, because there's the moment of reality, there's the moment of, okay, I've been doing this for this long, and it's gotten me nowhere, what is my next step? Do I quit what I'm doing? Do I go to something else? Do I move on to something else? How much longer do I give? This is the number one question that people have. Dog, you don't think I had it. It was crazy. You know, and I started this at 28. So at 35, when I was broke, everybody else had money around them. And I'm still fucking living like a fucking bumpy, you know, like, you know, hand them out. And I'm still a sort of an open mic 95, seven years later. So, uh, or 90, whatever the fuck I'm trying to say to you people. It's the decision to to do something and stick with it is fucking hard. It's hard. It's hard to go, okay, I'm going to quit my job where I get 600 a week, 800 a week, 1200 a week insurance, blah, 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 to do a commission job that, yeah, I can make 200000 a year, but the first six months, I'm going to live below my means. Well, you put away some money. And then you'll say to me, well, Joey, what if it, what if I don't start making money after six months? Then don't take the job because you're already lost in your mind. You're already lost in your mind. You know, when you when you take those type of leaps, there's a lot of things to consider. When you're single, who gives a fuck? Go for it. If it fails, you failed. It's on your shoulders and you start all over again. You can fucking bounce off from that shit. It's when you're married and have somebody else on your shoulders and have a child, that those decisions are tough, you know. Now is when we talk about the comedy aspect of it. Because I compare the comedy aspect to any other thing, whether it's it's a job or anything. You know, how long do you stick with it before you tell, you know, how long do you stay at McDonald's? How long would you stay at McDonald's? If you started working at McDonald's at 18, to help you go through college. How long do you stay at McDonald's for? You know, you stay at McDonald's until one day you say, I'm not mopping this fucking floor no more. Because what are the promotions at McDonald's? I mean, you're in the back, you're in the front, then you become an assistant manager, then they move you, then they give you a store 82,000 miles from your house that you're a manager at. You know, everything has a breaking point. Like that. I have friends, yeah, that still have their same job that they've had since they quit high school. But I know that sometimes they hurt because they wanted to do something else. But at the same time, they couldn't because they had a wife and kids. You know, it's 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 not easy to make a life-changing decision when you have a wife and kids. That takes real balls. But that also takes belief. That's the second part of the com- conversation. So you realize something, you know, what if, 
<clears throat> let's be honest, in 2000 and whatever, 11, whatever the fuck, I was not sad, I was not angry, I was not depressed, I just didn't think I could do what everybody else had done. I never saw myself playing a theater. I saw myself headlining. I was headlining a lot of rooms, but I wasn't really a headliner. And I took some time off before I went to the store. And I remember I said, you know what? If I'm not going to do the store and if I'm just going to go on the road with Rogan, I got to give myself a homework assignment every week. I'm happy I did this. And every week on Thursday night, I would drive to the fucking Irvine Improv and I would sneak in the back and I would sit there with, with sometimes I put sunglasses on. It was the creepiest shit I ever did. And I watched every headliner for about nine or 10 months. From Greg Geraldo to the big black dude that died, got rest his soul. I watched Ralphie. I watched everybody I could that I hadn't seen. Jim Gaffigan, anybody who played the Irvine Improv that year, I watched. And on the drive home, I came to the conclusion that I was fake headlining, like I was a fake headliner. I had to figure out something to put my jokes together. If not, I was just another comic telling jokes. Between Greg Geraldo, Ralphie, the big black guy, there was a lot of comics where I went home thinking about their act. Even if I didn't like them personally or whatever, at least I, I learned something from them that I had to do. I knew that I had to fucking do something with my life. But I tell you what, I didn't want to put the work in. I'm not going to lie to you guys. Right now, at this point in my life, I'm happy. I'm booking commercials. I'm booking TV shows. My friends have TV shows that they give me. Between the Rogan work, fucking the, the work that I get, the commercials I book, I can make a simple living. I, I mean, it wouldn't be a hundred grand. But I can make a simple living and want a job. I can make make a hundred grand. And I'd be fucking happier than shit to me. That that you know, I, I'm not doing coke. I'm not on jets. I'm not out partying. I don't give a fuck. I was pretty content with that. I really was. I, I the reality was that I'd done movies. I'd done TV shows, and I hadn't moved the meter on my stand up. The meter on my stand up had not moved. And hey. It happens. For some people do one line in a fucking movie, and the next week they're selling out theaters. That didn't happen for me at all. And I saw the movie thing, and I saw the TV thing, and the recurring, and it still just wasn't moving. And I didn't know how to make it move. I had no idea how to make it move. And in February 18th this year, Ari's doing a show at the uh, comedy store, Monday the 18th. And Tuesday's my birthday, February 19th. And I asked Ari, why was he doing that show? And he goes, because it was the ninth anniversary of the first time we did the storyteller show in the lab in the back of the improv. And I go, it was nine fucking years ago. It was me, Mark Marin, and somebody else. I forget who else was it. It was, and it was in the back, and there was maybe 30 or 40 people back there, and I was gonna go up there and tell a certain story, but while I was sitting there, I thought about the wall story. I was getting tickets for the wall, me and Joe Focaraccio and Loops, and him flicking the cigarette in the shirt. I just told the whole thing and how it led up, and that's when storytelling came up. So think about it. I was ready to quit doing comedy on the road, because I needed something to tie together the pieces. If not, I wouldn't have grown. And next thing you know, storytelling comes along. And that was the piece I needed at the time. I, I didn't know my stories were gonna work. I didn't know people were gonna tune into them. But I jumped on that bandwagon and it lifted my stand up a little bit. So, not, it wasn't that I was quitting. It's that I came to a realization that if I went on the road, I was going to go on the road for 30 people a night. Yeah, people knew me from the Rogan podcast and people knew me from fucking the longest yard and doing shit like that. But I wouldn't have come to that opportunity.
opportunity, which that's what it was. It was an opportunity that opened up storytelling. Oh my God. Now, I've been telling these stories to these comics for years. Whenever I went to New York with Rogan, I would point to different places and he would go, why don't you talk about these on stage? And I would go, because nobody wants to fucking hear them. But that's the direction I took. That was the decision I took. And now, if you come watch me, I'm kind of a storyteller who tells jokes. But at least the joke has an explanation with the story or the story has an explanation for the joke. So I had that gap in the road because everybody told me it was television and film. I attacked that and the answer was right in front of me. And it was the work I had to put in. So now I had to start sitting down and writing stories and thinking about shit and asking my friend, my friends stupid fucking questions. And they're going, why are you asking me these questions? And I'd bring up a story and then they'd add another story to it. And it was a really great process that I went to. But going back to realization, like I was running around a muck until 1984. And then 1984, I came to a lot of realizations. I came to the realization that I was a fucking moron. I came to the realization that I was a drug addict. Not really. I didn't come to that realization that I was a drug addict at that point. I just had a realization that I was a fucking moron and B, that I wasn't going to do anything in my life, that I was done. I gave up at the age of 21 years old. I was like, I'm just going to be a fucking piece of shit in the bubble. I'm never going to get nowhere. And it was because of five years had gone by and I hadn't done nothing with my life. I thought that the world was going to hand you something. See, I thought the world was going to hand me like a union book and I was going to make $23 an hour and drive a Corvette. It didn't work that way. And then after that realization came was when the drugs came in. And then thanks to God, I met a, I, I bumped into an old friend and he took me to a meeting. And that's when I realized I was addicted or whatever the fucking words they use or whatever. And I got clean. <laughs>